that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum physics showed us that you can't know the position and momentum of a subatomic particle at the same time. You just can't do it. It's not a matter of not having good enough instruments or not being clever enough. It's just a fundamental barrier that nature puts in your way. Um, in logic, Gödel's theorem tells us you can't prove certain things even though they're true. So we, there are all kinds of limits, but those seem a bit remote from everyday experience. And yet, I think there are really important limits on our knowledge that we're all familiar with. What I'm thinking of here is our inability to think about big numbers. Because with your fingers, you've got 10, you know, normally. So we're good at 10. We're barely good at 100. And once you start getting to thousands, millions, billions, and trillions, it gets hazier and hazier. When you hear now about the trillions of dollars in the deficit or whatever it is, the debt, you know, we don't, that means nothing. How, how are you supposed to think about that? Now, when you ask why can't we understand the common cold, but we can put a person on the moon, it, it has to do with large numbers. Not just large numbers of numbers, says Steve, but large numbers of things interacting. That there are so many genes involved and so many biochemical reactions involved. Our brains are limited. Our memories are very limited. And so um, I worry a little bit that that we might be approaching the end of our ability to have insight into certain kinds of questions. What Steve means by the word insight is not like he found the answer. It's like that. It's like a feeling. Right. You're like that, oh, I get the it. The feeling you get when you really understand the answer. Yeah, that satisfying feeling that I can see the reasoning. I can actually feel it in my bones. That's, that's a very pleasurable feeling, but um, one that we may not always be able to enjoy. I mean, you can see the space. Good uh, luck. We weren't really quite sure how to feel about this. Right. But well, then Steve said, yeah, don't take my word for it. Talk to these guys that work down the hall for me. You'll see. Yeah, we can We can go right ahead. Cool. Can you guys introduce yourself? Tell me uh, who I'm talking to. Yeah, so uh, my name is Hod Lipson. My name is Michael Schmidt. I'm a PhD student. And uh, I'm a roboticist. And Hod and Mike have developed this thing, which does make you wonder if Steve's right. It's a computer. Yes. Actually, many. A whole tower of computers that are all grinding away and performing calculations. Actually, when you get down to it, it's just a piece of software, but they've named it. The Eureka. Because that's what it was designed to do, to have Eureka moments. Uh, may, let, uh, maybe a, a kind of simpler example. And the story of Eureka begins pretty so simply. Think of a with a regular pendulum, okay? The pendulum. Just one of these things you see hanging off a grandfather clock. Okay, I've got a regular pendulum swinging in my mind. Okay, swinging left and right. Now, says Hod, double it. Instead of a string connected to a ball, make it a string connected to a ball connected to another string connected to another ball. Which is basically like a double pendulum. The cool thing about this is you just put it up, you, you lift it up and let it go. And what you'll get, says Mike, is chaos. It's really crazy behavior. Instead of nice and even, now you got random. It's almost impossible to actually try to predict where this thing will move. So what they did was they got a camera, connected it to Eureka, and basically just had Eureka watch this thing, you know, move about crazily. And then they asked the computer a really simple question. Can you make some kind of sense out of this erratic behavior? Like, is there something in this system that always stays the same? Tell me, what about these pendulums over time is not changing? Because with everything, there's got to be some kind of logic in there. So you're looking for a law, basically. I mean, you're looking for the law of the double pendulum. Yes, that's the idea. So Eureka is there watching this pendulum. It was about 3 a.m. in the lab. And it's basically spitting out all of these different guesses. It's formulating hypotheses. It's getting closer. It. Closer. It. And then onto the screen pops this simple formula. F equals M A. What is F equals M A? Is that actually the law that... F equals M A is Newton's law of motion. The Isaac Newton. That's Sir Isaac to you. It's a basic law of physics. And one of the greatest discoveries in the history of human thinking. Took it about a day, 24 hours. But, but the interesting thing is that it came up with this thing without knowing anything about physics, nothing. That's why we kind of we think that this algorithm might be able to find new laws that we don't know about yet. In fact, once word got out about Eureka, 
That's when the emails started. A couple of emails a day. From scientists all over the place who were like, Hey, do you mind if we borrow your robot? For what kinds of stuff? Um, anything you can uh, think of, from uh, trying to predict behaviors of cows in a herd, to particle physics, to the stock market. And that, and this is when we get to Steve's point about the limits of insight, that's when they met this, this guy. guy. My name is Garol Sowell. Garol is a biologist. At the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He got in touch with Hod. And he said, I have this amazing data which is single-cell dynamics. Meaning he's got this tiny little thing. It's a simple bacteria. Really basic. And he's been collecting this information on how it works. On its inside. How things go up and down. Certain nutrients increase, certain nutrients decrease over time, just like a pendulum. But the thing is, in a cell, it's like thousands of pendulums. And there's so many parts. Genes turning on and off. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands. Of Proteins turning on other genes, nutrients going up and down. It's this crazy quilt of complicated feedback. And he wanted to know, inside of this cell, how are all of these things related? I mean, we can measure it all, we can see things going up and down and all that. But what are the rules? What are the rules? Yeah. And this, he says, is the problem for biology. Biology is one of the least well-understood systems compared to, let's say, chemistry and physics. They're still lacking the basics. So we said, look, Mr. Robot, <laughs> can you tell us what you think are sort of the important principles governing this organism and maybe detect things that were hidden from us. So he sent us the data and uh, we analyzed it and... Uh, well, okay, let's yeah, not... Let, yeah, so what happened? Suddenly, equations started popping out. Almost immediately. The robot came back to us and said, okay, here's a set of two equations that describe your data. Do you remember by any chance what the, what the actual equation was? Not, not that we'd understand it, but just sort of to hear it said out loud? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't have my Rain Man skills uh, <laughs> developed to that degree yet. The right. important thing is that the equation was telling him things like when this protein goes up, this other thing always goes down. And when that thing goes down, this gene turns on and then there's a loop-de-loop. -loop. And when he went to his cell to check all this out, the equation was right. These equations match the data. And in fact, they explain new data. These equations could even predict what the cell was about to do. But, hold the champagne, there's just one little problem here. The formulas check out, but... We don't know what they mean. You don't know what they mean. Right. Meaning they don't know why these equations work. Why, why when this goes up, does that go down? Why, when that goes up, does this go sideways? Why? I had to first look at this and try to make sense of it. Uh, we said like, oh, okay, I think we understand. And we're like, oh, maybe we don't. We think that we're close to understanding it. But you know, now we're in this bizarre situation. We can't even publish it right now because we can't just publish a equation without explaining it. So in the end, they're in this awkward position where they've got the answer, but they don't have the insight. And I think it's a preview of what's to come in science. The more we turn to computers with these big questions, the more they'll give us answers that we just don't understand. We'll be faced with this challenge of having to find ways to get a computer to explain what it found. But that will leave us, if this really happens, in some weird position as bystanders where we're, we're sort of listening to the oracle but not really understanding the answer. Is there going to be a time when we we can't cut it anymore. We've had this, this window in human history when we could not just know things, but actually understand them. That is, you could know why they were true, not just know, but to know why. And that's a beautiful moment in human history, but I, I feel like it may only be a moment. Well, I don't really see it quite that, that sort of sad and dramatic, because <laughs> at the end, there will be simple principles to describe even the most complicated of processes. So you have a bias that prevents you from feeling the kind of despair that Steve feels and that we were hoping you would feel. <laughs> oh well, I'm, I have a positive outlook. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just wondering about the we. Look what we have discovered, you'll say when you're an old man with your robot sitting there in a dress next to you. <laughs> and the robot will be holding your hand, but that will be a cold hand. <laughs> And Jad and I will be thinking, I don't know, who's the we here? I say, I, well, I would say we is sort of knowledge. I'm just thirsty for understanding and thirsty for knowledge. Me and the cold hand holding my hand, <laughs> we've accumulated and contributed to the overall understanding of something that we thought maybe 50 years ago wasn't possible. And that would be something that would make me happy. Uh, 
Um, right. Okay. So this is very interesting. I think it holds up. This is a, a, a deep learning was only just starting up, right? That was only just starting to gain some traction. Uh, so that was, but this work was done really around the same time. Josh Bongard, who's here, uh, was part of this group. So they said they were roboticists, and so Hod Lips, he did his postdoc with Hod Lipson at, um, at uh, Cornell. And Nick Cheney, who's just come back, uh, he was an undergrad here, and now he has a research position here. He was a PhD student with, with uh, Hod Lipson, who's a very famous character. Uh, so they're... <laughs> I don't know if that paper was ever published, but I think they've had other things like that too, which they can, you know, they can predict stuff, but it's very unsettling because they have equations. It's different to having a you know, uh, deep learning thing that predicts stuff, but you're not even trying to understand it, right? That's, a, you know, that, that's, that's a, some sort of game, fair enough. Uh, this is something where there's something that you should be able to understand potentially in front of you. So, very interesting piece. Um, I don't know, and maybe Strogatz is not far off. We, we don't know. I don't think there will be simple explanations for certain things. All right. All right. And the slow TV thing, that's just there for therapy. There's plenty of good stuff around. That's from uh, Norway. I think they just uh, they had this thing where they just hooked a camera up to the front of one of their trains and put it on basically PBS. They have one for a ferry that goes for four days. Just just a ferry. And I think it might have started off with just video of wood burning, of people making uh, fires in the woods and burning it all. And that was just on TV, right? Um, very enjoyable.